This is Live Fire, with the latest news about threats to your liberties and your right to keep and bear arms. Remember, the issue is not just about gun control, it's about control. And welcome to another edition of Live Fire on the Gun Owners News Hour. Want to deal with a... Uh... A book with a nice title. It's a sort of return to uh, Saul Alinsky. It's rules, but a better set of rules. Rules for Patriots. The author Steve Dace is with me now. He's a syndicated talk show host. Wish I could be on as many stations as you are, Steve. I'm really p- pleased to see how your show's been growing. Well, thank you, Larry. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. By the way, there's something that uh, most of the listeners probably haven't heard of, even though there'll be some time, uh, this event occurred sometime before you're listening to the show. But in Pennsylvania, on the 13th of March, if I got my Tuesdays right, there was a special election to fill Mm -hmm. a, a state Senate vacancy. And the Democrat got about 24% of the vote. The Republican got 26% of the vote. And a write-in Tea Party candidate got 47% of the vote. I would say the natives are restless, Steve. (laughs) Completely agree, uh, Larry. I think those sorts of events, uh, they they just kind of build on one another organically. Uh, People are uh, talking openly about third parties. And legally, it's it's quite an undertaking. It's probably a multi-billion-dollar enterprise just to break the monopoly of ballot access Republicans and Democrats have. You look at neither the Constitution nor Libertarian parties are able to get ballot access in all 50 states, and the parties really colluded with each other after what Ross Perot did in 92 to make that much more difficult. But even though these things might be legally difficult, they have a way of spontaneously combusting. And you just talked about what happened in York, Pennsylvania on March the 13th. And in case your audience isn't sure about that community, it's a Dutch community, rather conservative, but not just politically, also temperamentally. I mean, if you, I grew up in, in you know Dutch West Michigan, so I, I know those uh, those people really well. And they're not prone to wild hairs or wild swings of emotion either way. So Correct. this wasn't just like they just had had it and they couldn't take it anymore. This clearly had been building for quite a while. In this case, this gentleman owned a small business, a trash compacting business. He won as a write-in candidate, as you mentioned. And just so people understand the size of this district, it wasn't like it was 1,500 people that voted. Almost 11,000 people voted in this election, he got almost 50% of the vote as a write-in candidate, and ironically, he credits the amount the Republican, the amount of times the Republican Party attacked him for daring to run as a write-in, he said, they gave me all kinds of free publicity, they actually helped me out. So that's one of those warning shots. You know, you wonder sometimes if the Founding Fathers at Lexington or Concord, if they really knew in that moment, you know, what they were really going to be launching over the course of the right. next eight years, a full-bore revolution, or if those were just skirmishes of the moment. And you wonder sometimes about stories like this, too. Let me circle back to York. Just one brief comment in addition to show the cluelessness of the Republicans about what's going on certainly this year in the minds of the most of the voters. The attack against the trash hauler was that he was an environmental polluter. That was the best the Republicans could come up with against this guy. And obviously, if that's the sexiest issue they've got, they're going to be on the trash heap of history. Actually, I, 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 this is a, a kind of a one-off because I agree very much with what you were saying. This uh, situation like this won't normally be the path to victory, but there are a lot of primaries and there are some very deserving senators that are getting pretty credible opposition and we've uh, been involved already in some of those and hopefully we'll be in some others and in fact you've got an interesting primary in your state well if you look at what's going on in this primary cycle and you can see if, if you really all you need to know about the republican party ruling class larry is is the is the kentucky primary and, and you watch we we're, we refer to him on my syndicated show as ditch mcconnell you watch ditch mcconnell who has been in the u.s senate for 28 years and his only claim to fame is what he can pinpoint about Matt Bev and his primary opponent's record, things he doesn't like. He's been there for 28 years. He has voted on upteen amounts of legislation. You have a record. You should not have to run on what, you, what it is you don't like about your primary opponent. I mean, you should be able to just stand up there, especially in a state. Mitt Romney won by 20 points in 2012. You ought to just stand up there and say, hey, this is what I've done for the party, for conservatism, for the country. And the fact that you don't see that, and you don't see that not just there. You don't see it in Tennessee with Lamar Alexander. You don't see it 
uh, in Mississippi with Thad Cochran, who I think is really in a lot of trouble. Yes. And 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 when these guys who have been in this, who have been in office for this long, cannot run on their records, but have to run on contrived talking points about the personas of their opponents. I think they're almost tacitly admitting they should have been primaried long ago. We haven't got it up online yet, although maybe by the time uh, folks are listening to us. But we've commissioned a cartoon, and it uh, is directed to Senator McConnell, who said not too long ago that we're going to crush the Tea Party. And after what happened in York, Pennsylvania, and, and we'll reference that in a cartoon, um, then we've got Mitch McConnell laying flat as a pancake, having just been run over by a steamroller. And um, I think it's Mitch McConnell that's going to see some of his buddies, maybe he himself, get crushed. Uh, the, uh, people are uh, going to do some different things that they don't normally do. Republicans have been very loath to turn an incumbent out. I don't think that's a concern at all this year. I think they're just angry, and they want to get the people out that they know have been causing the problem. Well, you you referenced the title of my book. There's a reason that the publisher did not call it Rules for Republicans, but it's called Rules for Patriots, because we have learned the last few years the hard way that just because Republicans win doesn't mean conservatives or libertarians or patriots win. And the way the book is conditioned, in fact, this whole conversation, the battle plan is what I call my Ten Commandments of Political Warfare, and, and they're in the order I think they need to be adhered to. And the very first commandment, never, ever trust republicrats. And I think, you know, we've tossed the word rhino around so often, I don't even know that we even know what it means anymore. But to me, a rhino is somebody who who runs left, governs middle left, there's somebody who really is just a Republican for Republican sake, but is really a liberal. Uh, you know, an Arlen Specter, a Christy Todd Whitman, somebody like that. A Republican, though, is dangerous, much more dangerous, Larry. That's, that's the wolf in sheep's clothing. Mm -hmm. That's the guy that, that the consultants have said, hey, since the Reagan Revolution, this is how you patronize these people. This is how you condescend to them. This, this, these are the talking points they want to hear. And so when they're around us, they sound great, like McConnell showing up at CPAC waving a gun, for example. And, and they know exactly, you'd never see an Arlen Specter show up at uh, CPAC back in the day waving a gun. He wouldn't show up at CPAC at all. Okay, so the Republican, though, is worse. He will try to deceive you. And then once you put him into office, nothing changes. And in many cases, he acts as a human shield between you and the statist. And that's what we have way too many of these. And the Republicans are also dangerous, Larry, because they can get elected all over the country. Pretty much rhinos are relegated to blue states where there really is almost no pocket of conservatism left in some of those communities, like a Massachusetts or a Vermont, a state like that. But, you know, a Republican can get elected in Kentucky. He can get elected in Texas, like John Cornyn. He can get elected in a lot of these other states because right. he culturally knows the lingo. And, and, he's, and, and then once he gets into office, though, the voting record and the actual look of government itself doesn't look much different than if he let the Democrat win. Well, um, we can just be in prayer that this is going to change somewhat this year, and we're going to uh, send a message to some of these folks. And if we send that message, hopefully the ones still remaining will uh, behave a little better. You are online, stevedace.com. Anybody can hear you anywhere in, in the world at that time. So um, do yourselves a Give yourselves a treat, folks, and go to stevedace.com uh, some evening, uh, 6 to 9 Eastern Time, and see what's going on. It's, uh, for my money, it's the, it is the, you have, Steve, the best regularly scheduled national talk show uh, that's out there. And there's some, you have some good competition, but I like your blend of Christian conservatism, free market, uh, just everything right down the line. So, uh, hooray. Well, that is quite an honor, given uh, the current company. So thank you very much, Larry. Well, my pleasure. I'm just delighted that you've been building your show. It's obviously successful. More stations are taking it. Um, so I'm uh, very enthusiastic, and I think it's, um, it's a good thing for the country that we get that kind of information that you're putting out. i like to just go back to kind of something that you said uh, before the break that I, I kind of like the way you put it in the book that we now have no longer a democrat ruling class and a republican ruling class they're all the same now it's the joint democrat republican ruling class against us uh, mm -hmm. so the, the two-party leadership that's not to talk about the rank and file but the leadership 
uh, has combined almost self-consciously. When you see Mitch McConnell and, and John Boehner going out of their way to facilitate the passage of Democrat legislation, then you realize uh, they are truly Republican in name only. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> well, we're in a situation where Craig Shirley, Reagan's former biographer, uh, recently referred to uh, the Republican Party as a, quote, crime family, unquote, for the way that it does business. And you were just mentioned it a few minutes ago in our last segment. But what they tried to do to this small business owner in York, Pennsylvania, who dared to defy their two-party scheme. I mean, those are the antics, uh, those are the antics of, of a crime family. I won't tell you who it was with, but I had a private conversation with one of the founding fathers of the conservative movement at CPAC last month, and we sat down one-on-one -on -one and had a pretty blunt, uh, you know, overall look at where things had gone, sort of the founding generation talking to the new generation of the movement. And I was stunned when he said to me, Larry, I don't even consider myself a Republican anymore. He says, I... I consider myself a conservative operating within the framework of the Republican Party primary system to get as many people as I think are good elected. And if my people don't get elected, then we just move on to the next primary cycle. And keep in mind, this is a guy that is one of the founding fathers of the conservative movement. So when, when you have guys like this or former Reagan's, Reagan's former biographer pointing out what is going on, it's no longer just the radicals, the Steve Aces and the Larry Pratts out there. I mean, the people that have been willing to work within the system are seeing that the system is, is really it's broken. And really what we have, as you stated, and we point out in our book, Rules for Patriots, really we just have a ruling class. We have government party A and government party B. The Really, you know, a, a good friend of mine works at Senate Conservative conservatives fund and he told me after spending a lot of time in washington dc he's come to the conclusion there's really only one difference between the leadership of the two parties and he says you know the democrats find ways to fire up their base to get what they want and the republicans have to find ways to betray their base to get what they want other than that there really isn't that much difference and i think you're seeing that across the country in fact that point segues to uh, another one that you've made in the book that while the democrats consciously effectively energize their base and I must say, I, I wasn't always aware of how effective this strategy was. I had my doubts about Obama uh, so overtly energizing his base during the campaign, thinking, well, you know, he's going to probably turn off some of those independents. Well, man, I was wrong. And for Romney and McCain, or McLoser as I prefer to call him, to have just absolutely done everything they could to dampen the energy within their base, they're afraid of it. Uh, they, they actually are Democrats who've called themselves Republicans because they don't understand that Republican base. They're afraid of that Republican base, and uh, they would do anything in the world to destroy it. It's funny you should mention that. I had uh, a conversation with uh, Ted Cruz recently. That was and, the next word and, out of my mouth. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was me, him, and somebody else, and the other person in the conversation said, uh, you know, why are you so successful and uh, so early? And I looked at him, and I looked at Ted, and I said, well, it really helps when you don't hate your base and you're not embarrassed by him. That helps. <laughs> you know, and Ted kind of laughed, but it's true. Absolutely. You don't hate the people you represent and you're not embarrassed by them. It's amazing how much more effective you are in representing them. And, and, you know, if we don't do anything at all that your audience today remembers, I'd like to, if you give me just a minute to share some data from this last election, because you kind of went there. That's out of, that's right in my book, and it's all documented. I know you've read the book, Larry. It's about 200 some odd pages, and it's got about 100 footnotes. So everything in this book is documented. Your audience mm -hmm. can go and look this up, because they think Romney lost for reasons that are totally wrong. They've all Good. been lied to. Good. Romney Romney won everything he was supposed to win with independence. Romney won independence in Virginia. Romney won independence in Ohio. He virtually had a tie for independence in Florida. He did 15 points better among independents in Colorado than McCain did. McCain lost them by 8 points. He won them by 7 points. That's a 15-point swing. He won independence in almost every key battleground state. If you switch the outcomes of, the, of those states, Romney wins the presidential election. Romney did not lose because of the Hispanic vote. If you look at the amount of white middle class voters that didn't vote in 2012 compared to 2008, the erosion of the GOP base, if you t if without those voters, Romney, and, without, and with only getting about 4% of the black vote, Romney was going to need to win, if you do the math, about 71.5% of the Hispanic vote to actually win this last election. This was a turn-out-your-base election. Obama did something that's only been done twice in American history, Larry. He got reelected by getting fewer votes than he got the last time. The only other two presidents that did that were Woodrow Wilson and Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and they did it because we were in world wars and a lot of their voters were on other continents. It's almost impossible for a president to get reelected by shrinking his base 
case, this guy did it because the Republicans voluntarily also shrunk theirs. I've got a friend of mine who says, you know, if Romney just would have stood in line on Chick-fil-A Day and had a chicken sandwich, he might have won the election. And honestly, it might have just been that. Every opportunity he had to send some message, even something subtle, like eating a chicken sandwich to his base, hey, I am with you, he punted on that every single time, even to the point that he became the first Republican presidential nominee to run pro-child-killing television ads. He ran them in my state of Iowa. He ran them where you are in Virginia. He ran them in Ohio, saying, no, Romney's not nearly as pro-life as people are making him out to be. And then he wonders why their base doesn't turn out. We had a Catholic for VP on both tickets. The Catholic vote was smaller in 2012 than it was in 2008. And here's the, here's the clincher to me, Larry. Romney actually got a smaller percentage of the Mormon vote than George W. Bush got in 2004. We had to work hard to do that, and uh, he was successful. The um, number that you have in the book that uh, said it for me was the number of voters that stayed at home that should have been voting for Romney, and mm -hmm. that was something like 9 million. Mm -hmm. Good night. If you look at the state of Florida, Gary Johnson's vote total in Florida is about 70%. Of, the mar of Barack Obama's margin of victory, about 70% of it. And so it's not just, you know, everybody talks to people like us, the evangelicals, that we're, well, we're just impossible to please. It's the entire GOP base that has had it. It's not just the Christians who are upset that, we're not, that, our, that our two pet causes are not being discussed. You're now seeing the, the rise of the Liberty Wing is, 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 is even worse news for the Republican Party establishment because I see these people very closely, as you well know, in my home state. They're very well organized. They're even less inclined to vote for the establishment than social conservatives are. And today, talking with Steve Dace about his book, Rules for Patriots. He has written this book when he's not doing his talk show, which is three hours every night, 6 to 9 Eastern. Uh, originates in Iowa, but it's um, obviously on the web. It's worldwide. and certainly on a lot of stations in the U.S., which is terrific, I think. One of the th things I took note of is the a number of the myths that you uh, presented, uh, myths that were coming out of the mouth of Karl Rove, among other consultants. And uh, frankly, one of the things that got me hooked on your book right away was the fact that almost right out of the gate, you started smacking Karl Rove around because he needs <laughs> smacking around. He is the architect, as he's been called by a guy I actually like, but uh, he's the architect not of victory and success, but of failure and defeat. The guy has an amazing reverse Midas touch. And when you look at the last election, he won one or none, I forget which it is, of the races that he was involved in. And they had a 1% return on investment and over $400 million spent. Now, happily, that word got out and apparently... It seems that he's operating with a lot less money. I guess last year, anyway, it was maybe down to a mere six million. Now, you know, if gun owners of America had six million bucks for their election fund, I guarantee you, we'd rule the country. Yes, it's just it's what a waste of money. But I'll bet there's some mighty wealthy consultants. I don't even know what the commission that they might get. Fifteen. I can give 20. you some numbers. I can give you some numbers. For example, Romney employed. In the 2012 election cycle, Romney employed 10 different consulting firms. Now, why a 60-year-old man needs 10 consulting firms, not consultants, firms, needs 10 consulting firms to tell him how to tell people who he is is beyond me, but I'll leave that for another day. He had mm -hmm. 10 consulting firms. He paid them over combined. They were paid by both him and the RNC over a billion dollars. All 10 of those firms are now back and being employed again. They work for people like Marco Rubio, Paul Ryan, and Chris Christie mainly. But imagine you you go into a job, and you go to apply for a job, and they say, hey, how'd it go in your last job? And you said, well, you know, I got I got paid a billion dollars to suck. Oh, you're hired. Who, who in their right mind <laughs> would hire people who wasted a billion dollars? Oh, but I it, know. But they work for all the right people, right? Yes. And so. Well, and it's an industry, you know, I, I, it, and that's really what it's become is we have, we've ceased being a movement. It has become an industry, and that's what, you know, there's a big difference. Here's the biggest difference between the Larry Pratt's and the Carl Rose. Or you want to show leadership to win. You believe that if we lead, if we show the country leadership, they'll vote for us. He wants to win to lead, and those are two totally different things. So he is totally focused on the process, only and only the process. 
You're primarily focused on advancing your principles and your worldview. And so here's what happens. If the guy only focused on the process wins, then he never fights, like we've seen the Republicans in the last year and a half in the Congress, because it's always, well, we'll fight the next time when it's safer. We'll fight the next time when it's safer. We'll fight the next time when it's safer. Right. You know, the guys representing us, they just want to win a news cycle, Larry. They just want to win an election. The people, the statists, they're trying to win a generation. They're trying to win a civilization. You can't beat people playing for big stakes when you are playing tiddlywinks. I don't think these folks, this consultant chattering class, understands, no, even though they, they can see what's happening with Senator Cruz, who has, I think, changed the dynamic, certainly Completely. in the Senate, I agree. probably in Washington, uh, and maybe even our national politics, because he has shown that when you sell ideas, which is what he's doing, process is going to take care of itself. Mm -hmm. You might have a lousy Republican get out the vote operation, and actually, from what we've seen, they have a pretty good one, had a good one in Florida in that special election, and evidently they might have had the same up in Pennsylvania, but it didn't do many good there. But this is something where the people will be motivated to come out and vote if you convince them that you're for real. Uh, we have been waiting for so long, and when folks like Cruz come along, no wonder he, he gets the money he needs to run. The way I understand it, when he ran in the primary against the establishment's candidate, he didn't have hardly two nickels to rub together for his committee. Mm -hmm. But as people heard him speak and realized what kind of a quality guy he is, the money just started rolling in. His uh, last reporting, his last campaign report that I looked at, showed that he had raised about $1.8 million in the quarter from about 13,000 donors, and over 11,500 of those donors had given $100 or less. So that is exactly what you're talking about. And, and, and even good consultants don't get it. I, a friend of mine who's a good conservative consultant, I won't use his name, we had this, him and I had a huge argument about the whole defund Obamacare thing and why it didn't work, he said. And, and, I, looked, and I looked at him and I said, brother, we are being backed up against a cliff. You're talking process. We have taken so many steps back. My next step back is down the is down the ravine, down the ridge. We lose. We hit. We go to a bottomless pit. I'm fighting for survival. I need you. When I fight for survival, I'm grabbing dirt. I'm grabbing rocks. I'm throwing everything I can to fashion a weapon against the people pushing me over the cliff, cliff to try and fight back. I'm not worried about process. I don't have time to be one of those deep baritone voices on Fox News who pontificate the lint in their navel every single night with the you know with the Fox News all stars. We're fighting for survival. We need you guys to be picking up dirt rocks and sticks and throwing them back at the status with us, not sitting over there like the two critics on the Muppet Show saying, hey, these guys are just never going to get it right. And I think that is even good consultants, movement conservative consultants, those involved in the machine, they just don't get it. And, and I'll also tell you, the great advantage that Cruz has is he is surrounded by young movement conservatives who want to go there and kick the tires and light the fires. And I'm telling your audience, Larry, whom your candidates surround themselves with, whom they take into the lion's den with them, is of the utmost importance. Uh, he's done it. Mike Lee has done it. Rand Paul has done it. That's very encouraging to see that those three folks uh, have been uh, on balance, extremely effective and wise in their hiring decisions and i think it's clearly making a difference and you know the the, the consultants that we were just talking about are convinced that cruz uh, was defeated when he had his talkathon uh, mm -hmm. uh, on the rollout of the zero care as i prefer to call it and um uh, frankly uh, from the moment he started up and then when i tuned in at something like uh, i don't know six seven hours later after he started and he's still going and, and he was still on topic you know he wasn't reading from the new york city phone book i i thought you know what this guy is finally explaining to the country what is so horrid about something that has not been explained to the american people yet and that's what ted cruz did and that was a monster victory we just had a date with uh, a homeschool day at the Capitol in my home state, which is the first in the nation caucus state. And as a homeschooler here, I go to this event every year. He, he came as the keynote speaker for the first time. It was standing room only, largest crowd by far, well over a 1,000 people, which is quite a bit in an off-year political event in any state, especially a state as small as ours. And I'm telling you, Larry, if the Iowa caucuses were today, he would win. The only way he would not win 
is if Rick Santorum was not in the race, and that gave enough social conservative votes to Mike Huckabee to overtake him. And the reason why he would win is because he's the one guy in the race that would actually take a little bit from everybody else's coalition. He'd take some of the libertarians, some of the social conservatives, some of the defense hawks. He'd take them all. And you know what that sounds a lot like? Reagan. That sounds a lot like the old Reagan coalition, doesn't Absolutely. it? Kind of a little bit of everybody's coalition. Absolutely. And the fact that he's a fighter, which is just so rare that and then as you say he's got all the legs of the conservative coalition uh, there in his stool and that i think is going to take him all the way uh, to 1600 pennsylvania avenue northwest i don't even know if he has an official committee yet and i know that people were talking about him for president when i'm not sure he was decided that that was what he was going to do. I think he's probably made his mind up to do it now. Yeah, there's only one reason an out-of-state senator comes to speak at Iowa's homeschool capital day, brother. You're not a vacation destination, Steve? <laughs> no, I've lived here a lot of my life. I love it, but no, we are not. <laughs> well, well, thanks for explaining that, because I was wondering why he was going there. And the same with uh, New Hampshire, and I think he's made more than one trip there as well. In our state, homeschoolers are the most politically organized conservative force in the state. That's where you're going to get your worker bees. They're not, we're not big. We're maybe 3 4% of the state, but we're a huge percentage of the Iowa caucus vote, a huge percentage of the worker bees, the grassroots, the volunteers. So you're, if you're an out-of-state senator, you only come to speak to that group for one reason. Well, you know, I think Huckabee still, as you have indicated, probably uh, has the affection of some of those same people but i think the more cruise operates the more they're they're likely to conclude that we love you mike but uh, we got to go with cruise this time i'm larry pratt of gun owners of america and i want to invite you to join the second amendment movement with gun owners of america the only no compromise gun lobby in washington take action by becoming a goa member today by going to gunowners.org Gun owners members receive the GOA newsletter, fact sheets, alerts, certificates, and more. But there's more to joining GOA than just a list of member benefits. The United Voice of GOA members has been successful in defeating restrictive legislation designed to disarm our population. GOA has helped to get strong constitutional members of Congress like Senator Ted Cruz elected. And with your help, GOA will continue to successfully defend the rights of gun owners in the courts. Participate in our efforts to restore and preserve the nation's right to keep and bear arms. All contributions to our lobbying efforts are used exclusively to support or oppose firearms legislation. Join online at gunowners.org. Talking about rules for patriots, and the author is with me, Steve Dace, talk show host uh, out of Iowa, but nationally syndicated. You probably can find him on a station near you, and if not, then go to the Internet between the hours of 6 and 9 and put in your browser Steve Dace, D-E-A-C-E dot com, and he will be there. I wanted to make sure we just kind of methodically went through the three myths that you explained and then knocked away because they are so prevalent. Uh, they won't die. I guess that's the nice thing about myths since they're not fact-based facts don't tend to touch them or something like that and so but anyway the, the one argument was that republicans lose because they're too conservative and frighten the independents away well we began talking uh, the show talking about an obvious case where uh, the most conservative guy in that york district won same thing happened in florida in the special congressional election and by the way i was delighted to read that mr jolly the victor the republican when he on election night he said i just want to uh, begin by saying i give thanks to my gracious god now i don't know anything about mr jolly other than that that i that i picked up on but I'd be willing to bet a nickel that uh, he's going to be pretty good on all the issues if he's willing to talk like that in public. Well, and you mentioned uh, the independent voters, and we went over some of, of those numbers. And, there, you know, I wrote a piece for Politico about a year ago, Larry, about what is the formula for Republicans to win national elections. And I went back to 1976, and there's a trend. Every national election the Republicans have won since 1976 has had said, and I use that year because that was really the dawn of the modern conservative movement in the Reagan Revolution. Obviously, when he challenged Gerald Ford, and there's two common denominators. Number one is the nominee has to inspire the base in the general election so that they think, even if he's not perfect, he's at least with us. He'll defend us. He'll stand with us. He won't. He won't kick us to the curb. He'll have our back. 
That's number one, because those are the people that are your P1s in any business. They're the ones that give you the word of mouth advertising, the stuff you can't, that you just, that money can't buy. So that's the first thing. And then the second is a, a right of center populist economic message, not you didn't build that or you did build that, but you can build that. That, that less government is an empowering force for individuals. That we promote growth and entrepreneurship, not K Street, K Street and, and corporatism. That's number one. And the second is a strong national defense. And so when you look at that formula, and, and then you, if, if you see that formula has played itself out in every national election the Republicans have won since 1976, you can see why there was never a President Romney, never a President McCain, never a President Dole, and yet these are the guys that keep getting reemerged in the media to lecture us about you know, what we need to do to win. And I wish one of these ruling class media reporters, and they won't ask because they love these kinds of Republicans because they do their job for them, but if I was sitting in David Gregory's seat just once, John, once later, I'd look at John McCain and I would say, hey, John, if everything you're saying is so smart, why didn't you win? Amen. Yes. That is such an obvious point, and yet it hardly ever gets remarked on. Um, and it would be the same with Romney. It would be the same with all these guys that have Bob Dole. Uh, they may be nice people in, in private, but they really don't understand politics. And I know that sounds silly because they have been in elected office, but they don't understand what. Uh, you know, they got elected, you know, Romney in, in Massachusetts. Well, okay, fine. Um, but obviously he couldn't do it in the whole country. What a brilliant idea it was to have the, precur the developer of the precursor of zero care in Massachusetts, Romney Care, be our guy to checkmate the author of Obamacare. Wow, what a business model. <laughs> well, and, and the thing, too, is you know, I, I know we want to use media bias. It's like... Media bias is like our white whale. It's our excuse for everything, why we fail in life, yet we have alternative media like what you guys do here, what I do every night, the column I write for the Washington Times every week, Fox News, all kinds of alternative media that Ronald Reagan never had, that the Republicans didn't have. It was just really just getting started in 1994 when they had their revolution. So, you know, how did they manage to do it? Well, here's how they did it. You know, when, when you're sitting in not one but two presidential debates and the average audience is 80 to 100 million people, which is a lot more than all these cable news networks get all year long combined, right. and the moderator in both, in both of those debates asks you a question about Benghazi, and you punt, and then not only punt, say that you actually agree with the way the president handled it, uh. don't, don't complain to me about media bias. When the guy standing up there that's your champion has the club in his hand in front of the national audience of the American people and refuses to use it, there is no amount of media fairness that can, that can compensate for that lack of courage or conviction, period. Oh, absolutely. That was so painful to watch that. That was a vivid illustration of the fact that, you know, we here in the, in the ruling class, um, we spar, but we're not looking to uh, knock his teeth out. Well, that's what the Republican ruling class says. I mean, we get called racist, homophobes, misogynist, sexists. Our guys stand up there and say, well, you know, I know he wants what's best for the country. We just respectfully disagree. Gee, I, you know, I debate for a living. So I, 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 I can pretty much tell you who's going to win that debate every single time. And it's not going to be the guy uh, that's, uh, that, that's doing the waltz while the other guy's firing a machine gun. It's not going to be that guy. Another example of um, selling ideas uh, is Scott Walker, who mm -hmm. is probably the most uh, battle-hardened uh, Republican official that we've got. And here's a guy, as you point out in the book, and I hope people will get your book because we're only touching the surface of rules for patriots. But here's a guy who had millions of dollars uh, of highly skilled union operatives trying to do everything to bring him down, and he got more votes in the recall than he had when he first got elected. <laughs> I think probably a lot of people don't understand why did they want to kill him so badly. And, and we talk about this in the book Rules for Patriots. There are four pillars of the, of the leftist, statist, Marxist movement in America. The uh, child-killing industry, the homosexual lobby, the government uh, education, that's sort of their youth ministry. That's how they get the next generation to indoctrinate them. The homosexual lobby and the abortion industry is where they get their mega, mega hundreds of millions to, to fund their schemes. But the worker bees, the grassroots, the mobocracy, the, 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 the hail Satan chanters down in Texas last year, that's the government sector employee unions. And if you cut them off, 
that's like telling that's like uh, cutting off the recruiting ability of a college football team that that's that's the lifeblood of their program are those government sector employee unions and if you do some of the math i think the average uh, u- annual union due in wisconsin is like uh, fifteen hundred dollars a year for an AFSCME mm-hmm. member and if they truly lost forty thousand members larry do the math forty thousand times fifteen hundred you could pretty much buy the wisconsin state government every year for that kind of money and to have him cut off the head of the snake like that he removed one of the four pillars he's, he's maybe the only elected republican in my lifetime i can think of that has actually removed one of their pillars and now you know why they have done everything they could possibly do to get rid of him and i would just say to your audience if you're supporting a republican that doesn't threaten at least one of those four pillars He's not worth your time. If you're supporting a Republican that aids and abets or collaborates with one of those four pillars, I don't care how good he is on every other issue, he's actually working for your opponent because that's the infrastructure of the American left, those four facets. You know, Reagan got elected pledging to get rid of the Department of Education, a great promise. Mm -hmm. He never did it. All he had to do was veto the budget, and he might have gotten it overridden, but I don't think so. Uh, In any case, he would have uh, done what he said he was going to do. And here, you, this uh, yes, in our lifetime, and I, mine's a little longer than yours. Uh, we just haven't seen anybody who's such a well. Cruz has uh, got the same uh, spirit, it would seem. So now we've got two nationally prominent fighters. Uh, I think Rand Paul and Mike Lee need to be in there. So maybe we, all right, we got four guys uh, that have proven that they're willing to fight. And when they went into the fight, I think they won each and every time. And they especially got people educated. When Scott Walker had those union thugs lying all over the lobby of the Capitol dome, the you know the Capitol building itself, they were such ugly, dirty people. Those are teaching my kids. I think people might have been thinking they lost so much stature. It was just amazing what was happening. Well, Steve Dace, thank you so much for Rules for Patriots, your book. I hope it's selling out and you'll have to get it reprinted many times. Thank you, Larry. I appreciate it. God bless you, brother. The Bill of Rights protects every American's God-given right to keep and bear arms. Now that right is being seriously undermined as legally registered rifles are being confiscated in some parts of our country. If we're not careful, we may find ourselves with no right to own guns. And that's where Gun Owners of America comes in. Gun Owners of America is in Washington every day fighting for you to keep that right. Congressman Ron Paul has called GOA the only no-compromise gun lobby in Washington. You need to be part of this great grassroots group of activists who are keeping the heat on their members of Congress. Find out right now how you can join. Call 888-886-GUNS and get started receiving their fact-filled newsletters and action alerts. Call 888-886-GUNS or go to their webpage at gunowners.org and help make your voice heard in Washington. Make that call right now and call Gun Owners of America at 888-886-GUNS. Remember, it's not just about gun control, it's about control.